as a brief review, very brief, because we'll get into the class, the topic we've been covering for the last, uh, this is now the fourth week, will be our relationship with God. And so as believers, we, we discovered, these are some of the topics we covered, that when man was uh, made by God, he was made in his image because of Adam. Um, his sin, like Romans 5.19 says, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Um, he blew it, and that's unfair. But Romans 5.19 doesn't stop there. It says, but by one man's obedience, Jesus, what he did, many can be made righteous. And that is uh, something to do with free will. So during the class, we discuss what free will is and what it isn't. We discussed that man, because of Adam, was lost and with no hope. And if you study through the scriptures, you're going to find out, this is me putting a little spin on it, Jesus' last name is Hope. He is our hope. He is our anchor. You'll see that in Hebrews. Um, his last name really isn't Hope. I'm just saying that so you can relate. So mankind is lost with no hope, but Jesus brings that off of hope. We discuss how sin came into the world, not just our trespasses, but a power. Sin is a source called the power of sin. We Examined that thoroughly in the last several weeks. We discovered um, because of what Adam did, all men are born into this sin. Um, we went on in week two to, dis to discuss how God had this love for mankind and Jesus was never plan B. He was plan A. Before Adam blew it, Jesus was plan A. God knew that he was going to redeem man because of the free will he would give them, that they would blow it, but he would bring them back, give them an option to come back. So it was God's uh, plan. We discussed, we went into seeing how God sent Jesus not, uh, to redeem man. Uh, Jesus came as a sinless sacrifice. We, we went on to discuss what salvation is. We discussed what true repentance is, a faith toward God, how important that is, and about the new birth. And then last week spent a whole chunk of it on what this new birth is by dissecting. It's a lot of it in Romans 6 we were discussing. Now this week, uh, should be our final week. Hopefully we can conclude and my wife should be teaching next week. We'll be discussing our glorious position in Christ about our righteousness and, and what about this righteousness. So our glorious position in Christ or in God, let's discuss what righteousness is. Righteousness is the original, in the original language, it denotes far more than what the English can communicate. We understand from a earthly perspective that righteousness, what it means, it means uprightness in the sense of adhering or conforming to an established norm. Whatever is considered normal, conforming to that is considered rightness. So righteousness is a nice word of saying rightness, doing things the right way. But in the biblical usage, the word right, righteousness is, brood, is, is founded in covenants. God relates to us based on covenants. So if I can put this thought out there for you, and we can discuss this if you like. Some people will say that the God of the Old Testament doesn't seem to be the same God of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God seems to be like he's wrathful. In the New Testament, Jesus comes on the scene. He displays God as this God of love. There seems to be this, like, this conflict. Like It doesn't seem like it agrees. And why would you think that? Put that as a question for discussion. Anybody? Any thoughts on why God appeared in the Old Testament as the God of wrath, and now in the New Testament, Jesus communicates him as being a God of love? Any thoughts on that? Anyone? He only punished people that did uh, things that were not right. <laughs> okay, this is true. And you said people, so I can follow that word. What people? Let's ask the question. What people did he punish? It's okay. It's okay. This is, I, want, I want us to kind of think out the process a little bit. And, and the key word is on the screen. I'm going to jump into it in a minute. It's in that last sentence on there. Oh. It's the word covenants. So in the beginning, covenants. All right. So I'm going to explain what that means. Think of it as a contract. Right? So when Adam and Eve were created, God didn't make an official covenant, but however, he did make them to live forever. So there's what's called the uh, Adamic covenant. And basically, if you ate of this tree, you shall surely die. If you don't, you will live. He blew that. There was a covenant involved. And God's relationship with Adam was based on that covenant. If you do mess up, you will surely die. He didn't die for 936 years later. It's a long life he lived. But spiritually, he was cut off from God. We see that in the same chapter of Genesis 3. 
Now, this thing about covenants, later on you'll find out there's a major covenant called the, uh, um, the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham in the Bible, so when I say Abrahamic, I'm referring back to him. Abraham was just like everyone else in the world. He was a moon worshiper. He followed false gods. God called him out and separated him. And because he believed God, just think of that. He believed the voice of God and what he said. He told him to separate, separate from his family, leave the country he was in, and I will make you a, a king. I will give you a land. And because of that, he believed, it says that righteousness was imputed to him. And that word righteousness, imputed, is the word logizomai in the, in, the, um, in the Greek, even though we're talking the Old Testament. Everything was written in Hebrew. It means, it's an accounting term that means that God actually gave him righteousness. And as we discovered, and we'll discover a little bit more about it today, this righteousness was God's very own. So God's relationship with Abraham wasn't based on Abraham working to be right with God, because he believed God, God made him right. The fulfillment of that, um, that fulfillment of Abraham's uh, righteousness for the rest of the world in Romans 4 talks about it wasn't just for him. It was for those who believe in the work of Jesus Christ. There was this culmination where it would all come to be made available to all of mankind. Abraham became what we call the father of the Jewish nation or the Israelites. But if you read, he would be the father of all nations. That happened at the cross. Afterward, the gospel message went out to more than just the Jews, but went out to the Gentiles. If you're not born a Jew, you're considered a Gentile. That's how the world is. That covenant that God made all depends on him. But for us, it just depends on us believing. Depends on us believing this gospel message. So God relates to us based on covenant. So in the Old Testament, people who weren't in covenant with God, he related to his people based on the covenant, and everyone else were outside of that covenant. In the New Testament, he relates to us based on that same covenant, but it's fulfilled, the gospel message. So what you see, it may sound convoluted, make it simple. The relationship that God had with his people because of Abraham and that relationship he made a promise uh, in Hebrews, it says that the covenant that we have wasn't based on man. It was God swearing to God. So this whole covenant is based on God swearing to God. And it also goes a little further to say Which that covenant? the Abrahamic covenant. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and the new covenant. It's one and the same, but it's being fulfilled. Yeah. So let me express it this way. God swore to God. And because God swore to God, it says that um, by two impossible things, because God cannot lie, that's the covenant we're under. If I were to examine that, it says by two impossible things, and God cannot lie. What are the two impossible things? One is God can't lie. Right. You know what the second one is? God cannot lie. I sound like a scratch record, right? I repeated myself. The Father of God wanted to redeem mankind. So before Adam ever blew it, Jesus, as, as I said earlier, was plan A, not plan B. So they had a counsel among themselves. How would we redeem mankind? This was a mystery. So Jesus said basically, I'll go. So God swore to God, I will redeem mankind, but I need someone to redeem them. Jesus said, I will go. He accomplished that with the finished work of the cross. And so based on this covenant, if either one of them can break the covenant, then this gift of eternal life basically can fail. Based on God, we're invited to the party. We're called beneficiaries. We get to benefit from the work of Jesus. It's a divine exchange. So the relationship, God bless you, the, the, the relationship is based on God's covenant to himself. That's how solid this new covenant is. It isn't based on your performance. It's based on believing that God had a message. He sent his son to deliver that message. And when he delivered it, he said, okay, now declare it to all the people, which basically is God sent his son to the world to become sin who knew no sin, to remove the the scourge that Adam, the condemnation that he brought on us so that we can be made right with him, righteousness, rightness with him. And so under the old and other new, it looks like God is wrathful or he's love. He's relating to people based on covenant, and that's what I'm explaining to you. The difference between the two is based on covenant. There were people that were outside of that covenant. That's why it looked like God was wrathful. He judged them based on their sin, that this is true, but they were outside of covenant. So First of all, God's character is holy, he's just, he's righteous. And if he's holy, that means he won't allow sin to come before his presence because he's a judge. He would have to judge that. 
If he were to ignore them, he really is unjust. So there's this balance with his character, his nature. And so based on that, it says, in the biblical usage of righteousness, it's rooted in covenants and relationships. God's righteousness is imputed. That was that word I said about Abraham. It's imputed or it's reckoned to the believer. It actually means an actual fact. It is yours for a fact. It is something you obtain. There is that divine exchange. We're going to dive a little bit more into this. So that was just the beginning. Let's examine what the word righteousness means. And the Strong's coordinates, if you were to look up righteousness, it would come up with a, the identifying number of G for the Greek words, 1343. That word means justice, justness, righteousness, righteousness of which God, notice this, God is the source. Mm -hmm. It isn't man. God is the source of this righteousness, or he's the author of it. It also means divine righteousness, only from him, not man's. We're not the source of this righteousness. He is. If we are, it's called self-righteousness, us as individuals. And the scripture says that self-righteousness before God is as filthy rags. And that word, for those who didn't know it, means a dirty menstrual cloth. Use your, use your imagination if you need to. <laughs> now, the root word righteousness is the word right, righteous, not righteousness, right? And that's an adjective. It means just in the eyes of God. It means righteous. It means you're, you're the elect. And that word elect can be very confusing. It just means that you were chosen of God, a special people. So before the New Testament ever came, when God started this relationship with Abraham and the people that would come from him, they became the elect of God. They know that. They don't need to be told that. They know they're the people of God. Under the New Testament, God made it available to the Gentiles that they can become part of that elect. And that was a controversy that the Jews couldn't believe that God would allow dirty or rotten Gentiles to enter into the family. And that was a conflict that Paul wrote about in Romans and Ephesians. Righteousness. This is a powerful verse. I love this from Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says this himself. There's a lot in here I can dissect, so I won't go in too many rabbit trails. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for in it, that word it, what is he talking about? What's the subject in the previous statement? The gospel. Yeah. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You see, free will is involved. You hear the message? If you believe, therein lies this power of God for salvation. First for the Jew and also for the Greek. So take it for the early church that it was, the early message that it was. It came from the Jews. Now the Gentiles are getting ready to hear this message. For in it, again, the it is the gospel. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, not man's. We just saw that righteousness, he's the source of it. For in the gospel, God's righteousness, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous man or woman shall live by faith. Grammatically, that is written, the, uh, by faith the righteous man shall live. That's grammatically how it's written. So if you're righteous because you believe in the message, it says, by faith, that's how the righteous person lives, from faith to faith. So grammatically, if you went to the Young's literal Bible, it will lay it down grammatically how it's actually written. And the reason why I say that, because sometimes we think it's something we have to do when he's saying, no, if you believe in my son, my power to transform you has taken place. And by faith, that's how the righteous, per the righteous person lives. Does that make sense? All right. So that's what faith to faith means. That's always confusing. <laughs> well, faith to faith, think of it as from step to step. So once you believe God's word and you believe what God has done to you through Jesus Christ, the transformation unto salvation has taken place. But then life goes on in this world and different circumstances and tests will come about. And as they do, you believe in God's word to get you through those, through those circumstances. So that's a faith to faith, almost like a test comes and by faith you trust him. That's how I live through this circumstance. Thank you. So the next one we're going to talk about on righteousness is in the same book, Romans 3, 22. If you didn't notice over the last couple of weeks, we're really dissecting a lot of stuff in Romans. I try to keep things in context and I bounce all over the scriptures all the time. Romans 3, 22 says, even this righteousness of God, remember it's God 
30 on the righteousness, he's the source. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. So basically, he's confirming the scripture. We're talking about God's righteousness, not man's. But it's available for man to possess. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. You've probably heard me read it several times through the weeks. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Who are the we? The believers. Okay. If you're a child of God, you're an ambassador for Christ, for his kingdom. As though God were making an appeal to you, we beg you. Notice that Paul's saying, we beg you. So this is actually a part of being like a person who shares the good news with someone who doesn't know the Lord. We beg the unsaved. Be reconciled to God. The verse before this is that God has reconciled the world to himself. And then he runs into this. Therefore, we, we beg you, be reconciled after you've heard the message. So reconciliation basically takes two parts. In this part, God reconciled the world to himself through Christ Jesus. But now he's saying, okay, now that you've heard the message, it's up to you and your own free will to believe it and receive it. And if you don't, well, then salvation, the power of God, hasn't taken place. We can intellectually say we agree, but did the heart transformation take place? Did you really believe? Are you trusting by faith? Not by sight. Big difference. That verse continues and says, I'll substitute the meaning here along the way. For he made him. Well, who's the first he? God the Father made him. And him is Jesus Christ. So let me read that into the statement. For God the Father made Jesus Christ, who knew no sin. It means Jesus never blew it. He never dropped the ball. He didn't sin like Adam. Who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. An exchange took place. He took sin that wasn't his, but on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And we discovered God's very own righteousness in him. That last him, in Jesus Christ. We're born in this world through the Adam's family. You know, physically we all come from Adam, but because of what Jesus did, if you can believe in this gospel message and receive it by faith, it isn't difficult. He says you will have the righteousness of God and you'll be placed in Jesus. You're no longer in the Adam's family. You're in the Jesus family. He does the exchange. It is an experience you're looking for. It's by faith that this is received. So let's discuss what this in Christ means. God looks at your new spirit man who is in Christ when he looks at you. He isn't looking at your performance. He is looking at the new spirit man in you. Last week, we discovered that when we were in Adam, our old spirit man was a slave to this power called sin. But because of what Jesus did, he took your sin man, crucified him, buried him, raised him up and said, here, I'm going to give you back a new spirit man who was alive. He lives unto God and he's not a slave to this power called sin. And unless we know that, we'll think that every time we blow it, oh, I'm such a sinner. That's what you were. Because you believe Jesus' message about being made the right of God, a divine exchange takes place in your spirit man. We saw in Ezekiel, God prophesied this several hundreds of years before Jesus came and fulfilled this for us on our behalf. He said you had an old heart of stone. You remember that? And he would give you a new heart of flesh. He said, you had it, I will give you a new spirit, which implied you had an old spirit. We discovered that old spirit is the one who's enslaved because of Adam. And there's nothing that he could do to free himself except to receive Jesus Christ so he would pay the offense for you, bury that spirit man after he's crucified him, and raise him up anew. Uh, let me ask you an obvious question. It sounds silly, but let's think about it for a second. Can you crucify yourself physically? You probably get two thirds there, but you can't finish. If I were on a cross, right, and I nailed my feet down, and nailed this hand down, what about this hand? I'm still free. Physically, it sounds like it's impossible. I need someone to crucify me. That's what the Holy Spirit did when you believe in the message. He crucified the old man. It's not possible that you can do it to yourself. I know there are scriptures that say we need to crucify the flesh. That's not the same as your spirit. Your flesh is your software. You're trying to crucify that old way of thinking. That's a free choice by replacing the old thoughts with new thoughts. The new thoughts are God's word, your identity, and promises that you can now live free from the power of sin. Sin never died. 
So the sinister source will continue to introduce evil thoughts to you and claim that they're your own thoughts and look at that thought you thought and call yourself a Christian. Hmm. Your new spirit man doesn't think that way. Your new spirit man is filled, first of all, with the righteousness of God. It can't blow it because it's not dependent on your action. It's dependent on what Jesus did. If it, if it depends on your action, then basically every time we blow it, we need to get saved all over again. But scripture says Jesus isn't coming back to be crucified again for you. One sacrifice for sins, plural, forever. And that plural, sins forever, it's a noun. All your transgressions have been paid for in full. Will you receive this incredible forgiveness? See how I'm going to think about that. So, God looks at your new spirit, man, who is in Christ Jesus when he looks at you. The old things have passed away. The old things, that old man, right? Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Let's look at Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love for which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, remember we were in Adam, we were caught up from God, we were spiritually dead in him. This is all past tense. He's talking to believers, remind them, there was a time you were dead to God, a slave unto sin, and he said, God being rich in mercy, with his great love for which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgression, he made you, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. And not only that, he raised you up. We saw that raising up of the new spirit he gave, he's given you in, in Romans. He raised us up with him. And look at this. Not only raised you up, he put you next to him. He seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that's where you are. You're right with God and on the right side of him, spiritually speaking. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. There's a lot here, but you can see how this talks about what we spoke about last week in Romans 6. He raised you up. You were dead in your sins. You were dead in your trespasses. But he raised you up. And he did it how? By grace you have been saved. Another question. Please. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> I... Um, I have thoughts that are critical of other people. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> I say something that's not nice. Okay. So the thought is from who or what. Okay. And the saying something is the sin. Yeah. <laughs> the saying something is definitely the offense, right? If it's if it hurts someone. Right. right. <clears throat> so let's just back that up a little bit. The critical thoughts can come from just the way that we see ourselves still. So there's an old software still operating. Oh, okay. Flesh. And until that's replaced by understanding how much you've been forgiven, and once you understand how much you've been forgiven that great debt, it's easy to respond in gratitude and thankfulness to God. And now that's an individual relationship. So that is a vertical relationship. Now, the rest of the relationship is the horizontal. Let's talk about the other part of the cross, right? Horizontal. So when we understand how much we love, we love others. If really we learn how much we've received from God, we learn to have a more sympathetic understanding of man's condition without hope. And then we can probably, before we say those things, catch, catch those thoughts and say, no, I shouldn't say that. It's old software. It's still operating. And there is going to be training. That's the discipleship process of learning who you are and you'll have more of a heart like Christ in practice because he saw people as sheep without a shepherd, without anyone leading them. And of course these people were not saved yet. No one was saved until Jesus went to the cross. Even his 12 disciples, none of them were born again. And if I were just to open that up a little bit I'm, being, I'm going on a little bit of a rabbit chase but Judas was a part of the 12. He betrayed Jesus. And if you didn't realize it, Judas, Judas was one of the 12 that was sent out and he was able to cast out demons. But the Holy Spirit wasn't in him. He was upon him. And so what I'm saying to you is the work of the Holy Spirit now is not upon you, but it's in you. Your whole spirit has been transformed. 
what needs to be transformed is the process of your thinking. That's why the word says to renew your mind daily. It's so important. So as you feed on the word, find out more of the work that he's done, the transformation that's taking place to you. That's why you notice I slowed the class down and began to dissect last week quite a bit. And that can, that can take a lifetime to continue to examine this because the more you do, the more you realize what he's done and the more you realize who you are in light of what he's done. And now, how could I walk this out? Guess what? You're free to walk this out. No longer a slave anymore to your old thoughts and reactions to those thoughts, looking for opportunity. It doesn't mean we won't blow it, but thank God we're not slaves to it. We're in the process of being discipled and trained. And what I'm saying is every thought that comes across your mind, before you say it, you can examine that thought and say, that's not of my spirit and that is definitely not of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I may see that person. I may be critical of that person, but put yourself in the equation. I'm seeing them. I'm flesh is getting involved with reaction. So we slow it down, allow the Holy Spirit to give us better thoughts of that person, or pray for them because of their obviously their state of hopelessness. They're different believers, and they could be believers as well. We could be critical of believers, see their imperfections, but we're all a work in process. Did that help you, Louis? Yeah. What about? Um words <clears throat> put in my head by the devil. Well, let me also... I mean, people say, curse the devil and he shall leave, and, you know, rebuke him and he shall mm -hmm. leave, so I keep thinking it's him giving me a hard time. Ah, well, <laughs> how, how about let's examine that for a hot second. <clears throat> um, when I spoke about Satan, we brought that conversation up, I think it was in week two. I discussed that Satan isn't God. He was a created being. Right. He doesn't have all the powers that we probably give him credit to have. Right. Right. So whatever he gives as a thought to you doesn't mean that he owns you to continue to think that way. So right. you, have, you have power over your thoughts in right. Christ. And, and what's important for us as believers is to understand the authority you now have too. And so when you rebuke him, we don't have to constantly every day when we get a bad thought, rebuke, rebuke. Let's use it like we were kids. Guys used to see girls walking across the street and they were just hanging out with, out with a bunch of guys. They say, hey girl, what's up? And all these flirtation things. The girl can feed into that. Or she can be a little bit short and just totally ignore it. And the guy won't get the satisfaction. And if I were to take that principle and say, well, why give Satan that satisfaction? You don't have to. You really don't. He's not that powerful. He doesn't know your thoughts. He can introduce thoughts to you, but he's not so powerful. So until you profess that he hasn't heard what you're truly thinking, that's important for you to understand. Yes? Um, I see it as like I'm around, around you. I'm around you. I, I, I provide you with that seed. Uh, it's going to be up to you uh, to make it go. And it's like when he um, put that thought in for you, I mean, like once that thought comes, you have to rebuke that. Like, no, I don't think like that anymore. So if you keep on like day one, day two, oh my gosh, then it's like it's you watering it. You do it's it in the process. Water. Yeah, you do it in the process for me until, I mean, be careful. You're going to have a big plan. And this is very true. He's, thank you for bringing that up, Richard. So we, we sometimes assign to Satan attributes that are assigned to God. And, and he can't, Richard said it very eloquently, he can't be everywhere at every time. But then remember, a third of his demons have fallen, and they're no good either. So the thing is, be careful with what thought comes across your mind exactly. Because if it doesn't align with what God would say to you, quickly identify that source. You don't have to say it's my thought because the minute, and that's the enemy's tactic. He'll make you use that personal pronoun, I, or, or it's mine, to take ownership of a thought that really probably didn't come from you. 
So that's, that's spiritual warfare when you really think about it. Sometimes we think spiritual warfare is casting out demons. No, spiritual warfare is a daily thing with every thought that is introduced to your mind. Guard what you hear because what you hear, if you allow, you'll allow to enter into your heart. Because it came across your mind doesn't mean it's in your heart. But sometimes we think, oh, I have a dirty old heart. Because the scripture says in the Old Testament, do not trust the heart is desperately wicked. Yeah, that's true. Guess what? But when you're in Christ, he gave you a new heart with new desires. That's not the same heart you have now. That was in Adam. And until you recognize that's not you anymore, it's hard to play defense because he's saying slaughtering you with this crazy offense because you think you're the dirty old sinner with the dirty old thoughts. That's what you were. It'll definitely make you paranoid. And, and I like what you said. You can feed that by bordering it, thinking it's yours. And then say, he's just looking for an opportunity to throw another wood on the wall to make it burn some more. When the defense, it doesn't have dominion over you anymore. And so it's, it's but the thing is to take authority. The thing is to take authority over those thoughts to understand what God thinks of you, what he wants of you. Because now you're free now to live unto righteousness. You're free to do good works. Because in Adam, you can do all the good works you want, but none of it will save you. But the works that you do now in Christ, they're, they've been assigned to you because of who you are. You can speak to the person who might need help. Share your testimony of what God has done. That's that growing from faith to faith and these different experiences that transform you and produce a fruit that you know that you're not the source of it. But you see this fruit, the 30, 60, and 100 fold. And when you declare those things and you tell people how God has done it, you don't have to use Christian language, righteousness and justice. You can talk in regular terms because that's what you want people to understand. And you give them hope because you're introducing them to the God who's giving you hope and has transformed you. Oh, coming on. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Quick thing before you say. Like, if you have to justify something, like there's a thing in practice, you have to justify it for, to make it work for you. That's when you have to stop and think, like, what's going on? Like, mm -hmm. okay. Hello. Oh, I know what you're talking about. You wanted to bring something up? Oh yeah, please. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. I like it. I like this. Okay. Um, there's this saying, um, which is a faithful saying to some degree, not exhaustive. It's not exhaustive. Uh, it says uh, you cannot stop a bird from flying over your head. <laughs> so the bird is like a thought. Yeah. So the birds, as we walk outside, they fly over our head. Yeah. Those are suggestions yep. flying mm -hmm. over us. And the, and the end says, but you can stop a bird from uh, making making a nest on your head and laying eggs over your head. Mm -hmm. So which means when you entertain that thought, you are allowing that bird to begin to mesh that nest yep. and even begin to lay eggs. Yep. Okay. So it's like, as long as the bird is just flying, it, it's it's a suggestion. Yep. It, it, it is it has not made its home with you, and um, and at, at that point it's just a thought. Yep. Uh, if we look at it from God's word, there's a place where Abraham was uh, uh, making a sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, he split the animals in half. One, put one piece this side, the other piece this side. But it says the birds of the air came to try and eat that carcass to stop him from giving that sacrifice to the Lord. So if our lives are the living sacrifice to the Lord, we are righteous. The birds always try to come and, and bring that thought to say, uh, no, you cannot stay in that covenant. Uh, you cannot grow from faith to faith. Okay. Uh, and the scripture says, but Abraham chased away the birds. So which means when we look at that saying, which says uh, you cannot stop a bird from flying uh, over your head, head um, but you can stop it from laying eggs over your head. In a way, when we compare it to scripture, the scripture goes further in that we can actually chase away the bird as well. Yeah, we can actually chase away the bird as well. Uh, because when we use the word of God to chase away the, the, the bird, 
the bread is able to run away like the way that the Lord Jesus used the word of God to, to rebuke Satan. So, so in uh, 30 seconds, just to wind up, <laughs> so which means we are able to use the word of God as a way of chasing away the bear, which brings in that Romans which says we should renew our mind with the word of God. Because once we have the word of God, we are able to speak the word. And that's, what, and that's the illustration the Lord Jesus did or used um, uh, during the temptations to chase away uh, all the suggestions which were put up to him. I have several that I use and I say them out loud. Yeah. But, uh, no, the thing with it Max is uh, he's a thing that as soon as it hits you, you can word it and rebuke it. Because not everybody, you know, knows the scriptures at heart, you know, that, that real well and don't know what to say at that moment. So thank God, you know, we just rebuke it and just renew our minds to something else, you know, and just pray, give it a short prayer there and then it's gone. It doesn't come back. <clears throat> so I would say this, I love the input on there. Appreciate that. <laughs> when he said the birds in the nest, just think of it for a minute. They're making nests, they're making a home. Yeah. And then, then they want to just raise a family. Yeah. So then what? Then they want to raise a family. Lay some eggs, oh. lay a family. <laughs> So to take authority over that is so important because if you don't take authority, Satan's going to try to make a home in your mind. That's where the spiritual warfare takes place, between these two ears and your thought process. But again, he is not as powerful as we give him credit. We've been raised to think he's all powerful. He's not. He's not all powerful. He wants to be all powerful, but he can't be. He's a created being with his own limitations. But he's a father of lies and a deceiver. And every thought that comes across yeah. your mind, if you identify it as a sinister source, guess who it's coming from? A father of lies. Don't let him make a mess. Don't let him start a family. Don't worry on those things. Cast your care on the Lord. Very important. Great input, guys. You guys are awesome. One more contribution. One more contribution. Sure. Even if you don't have a scripture, you just quote to say, I'm the righteousness of God, meaning I have righteousness. Right. So whatever you're suggesting, has no room because I'm I'm right. I, I'm in good standing with the Lord. Amen. I, I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. Right. And, and what's important about what he just said is yeah. that understanding that that is who you are because not of your doing, but because of what God has done. And you need to remind yourself of that. And sometimes, sometimes, maybe you need something physical to remind. Okay, because you may lose sight of that because of the business of life and things of that nature. And the reason why I said that, and I'm glad you brought that up, because that's kind of like divine timing. Girls, girls, hello. There's two. Give it to her. Give it to her. Stop. All right, listen. This ring I had made, put a cross on it, and the inside, it says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians 5 20. When I had it written and engraved on it. I look at this ring for that same reason. That sometimes if I lose sight of it, I look at it and I know who I am. I know it in here more than anything. But obviously, I carry something. Most of us will do it here, but we can't see it unless we're looking in the mirror. So I just had a ring made, custom made for myself. And so I'm just saying to you, it's so important for you to remember who you are. Thank you, because I think that's eloquent that you brought that up. And I've never, I don't tell too many people about this, but the reason I do is for that same reason. I want to do something, that may not be right. Sometimes you're seeing your hand at work, right? Well, that's why I have it right on my hand. So when I'm not at work and I'm not wearing my wedding ring because I don't want to get messed up from the tools, this is in place of my wedding ring. And I'm still able to see that I am part of his family, the bride of Christ. I am the righteous of God. An outward reminder that I can stare at, and I know what it means. I know it's on that ring. So that's something that I did to help as well in my work. So let's just finish up. We're almost there. Sit down, girl. A lot of editing today. <laughs> so second, uh, Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, For in him, we're talking about being in Christ. For in him is the fullness of the deity in bodily form. Meaning in Christ Jesus. And in him, you have been made complete. See, you're not lacking anything. Mm -hmm. But the enemy wants you to think you're lacking. You still haven't arrived yet. You're sitting in heaven's places. You have the righteousness of God now. He wants to teach you how to walk in rightness. Girls, let's stop talking. Thank you. Another one in Colossians. This is chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. 
we're talking about our thoughts, right? Set your mind on things above. You have to have your mindset on things above, not on things of this earth. For it reminds you, for you have died, past tense, and your life is hidden in Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So it's reminding you of setting your focus where it needs to be. And so a quick meditation, something to reflect on throughout this entire course. And I like this from the Passion Translation. This is from 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. Got to focus on his love for you. So look with marvelous love. He has called us and he has made us his very own beloved children. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is because they did not recognize him. And beloved, we are God's children, not tomorrow, right now. However, it has not yet appeared what we, what we will become. But we do know that when he is finally made visible, meaning Jesus, we will be just like him, for we will see him as he truly is. Very important for you to understand who you are. Know where you came from, but know who you are now. We were in Adam, we're now in Christ. We were sinners saved by grace, but now you're the righteousness of Christ. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you lose sight of that, the enemy is going to play with your mind to remind you who you were, not who you were. Your security is by faith to faith. Therein lies the power of God. Do you guys have any questions? Good conversation about our thought process and dealing with things. So I appreciate the questions. And everyone, iron sharpening iron, helping each other see how we walk this life out. I didn't figure it was, I was the only one with that problem. <laughs> no, no. Well, see, the enemy wants you to think that I'd way. I'd like to bring it and up. And think there's something wrong with you. Right. 